Ray Corley, retired superintendent of design and development in the TTC's equipment department, explains how the new subway was conceived and constructed. The Young Street's streetcar line uh, was approaching saturation, in fact, actually was saturated by the time the World War II was over, and there was no alternative, there was no other possible way of getting more streetcars on the, on the street. Uh, the only logical alternative was to have a rapid transit line on a dedicated right-of-way completely separated from surface vehicles. The alignment of the Young Street subway has puzzled many people. The line started from Union Station and made a very sharp curve up Young Street and south of College and Carlton, the line had to be built directly under Young Street by what is known as the cut and cover method. In other words, you lift the top off the street, you build a subway, and then you put the street back again. This was because on both sides of Young Street there was complete density of what in those days were considered high-rise buildings, both on the east and the west side. The subway would have interfered considerably with this unless it had been buried many, many hundreds of feet below ground, which was not practical because the subway stations were supposed to be relatively close to the surface. Once the subway got north of College in Carlton, they were able to pick an alignment parallel to and just east of Young Street where the building density was not as high and the subway could again run underground to just north of Bloor. This section later was converted, uh, even though cut and cover was used, it was again uh, covered over and much of it exists today as public parking lots. North of Bloor, just north of Bloor and Young, the subway came out into the sunlight of what is known as the Ellis Portal, ran through the edge of the Rosedale Ravine near Rosedale Valley Road, and was essentially above ground until reaching St. Clair Station, and then again came out into the open through Davisville and all the way up to the Eglinton Terminal. When they reached Eglinton, this was the site, of course, originally of the major Eglinton car house, from which the Young Street car service came, as well as the adjacent bus garage. The car house, in effect, was demolished uh, the new subway terminal was built underneath it, together with an office and shopping complex on top of it, and at the same time the garage, which lay just to the west of the car house, was expanded to take care of the feeder bus lines that were now being developed in the North Toronto area. The subway attracted large-scale commercial development to this transit gateway, as we call it today, like the building of the Eglinton car house did before it. Today the division is hidden by large office towers and a parking garage, but the new buildings can't obscure the memories that the former operators had of the Young Line. Let's take a final trip down the car line with Bill Reed, Bill Took, and Ken Allen. The wet streetcar of those days, an operator had to stand, his foot was on the bell and on the sander, his right hand was on the handle for braking, and his left hand had to turn a big controller with no dead man control. It was a winding up and you went through the series and then into full power. Sometimes if you didn't hit those series right, you would hear it sizzle. Next thing, before you could do anything about this, the whole thing would bang and blow and the cover would fly off and you were covered in black and you looked terrible. And the passengers would look at you and wondered what had gone wrong but this was known as a sizzler. Bill Reed also piloted the young trains downtown. Now, it was my responsibility as an operator to see that we got up and down Young Street safely. And there was lots of times when uh, we came pretty close to having accidents with these taxis pulling in front of you and, and stopping rather sharp. And you couldn't stop these 40-ton uh, vehicles on a dime, so it needs to say we had lots of accidents. <laughs> Yeah, when I was working out of Eglinton, the cars that were running on Young Street were the Wits. And my favorite cars was a 2900 series. They were the only cars equipped with the uh, quick release on the brakes, which was a big help when the rail got slippery. 
In the winter time, we had to uh, wear heavy clothing, uh, as the heaters that they had in these vehicles were coal stoves. And I'm sure that the pasture didn't appreciate the fact that there was a lot of coal gas used to come from these heaters, and they wouldn't throw that much heat unless you're sitting right on top of them. Okay, our schedule was uh, 42 minutes to go from Union Station to Glen Echo. Uh, there was 42 stops on Young Street, so you had a minute to each stop. And I don't know how uh, today it could ever be done today with the volume of traffic on Young Street. They're sure not pretty, but they did the job. These small yard shunters move the trailers about the yard into position for coupling at the beginning of the day and uncoupling at day's end. When the Eglinton yard was displaced by the subway construction, the cars were towed down Young Street in a parade only a hardcore trolley fan would appreciate. The shunters originally were equipped with trolley poles, but it was easier moving about the yard with pantographs. They were moved to a temporary resting spot at the Russell Car House in Toronto's East End, where they were later scrapped. One shutter was put to further use moving subway cars, but it wasn't strong enough to do the job and was scrapped in 1955. Because the trailer trains were permanently coupled together after their move from Eglinton to the Harbour Yard on Toronto's lakefront, the shunters were no longer needed. Bill Took explains the operator's typical uh, day. A typical day would probably start anywhere between 5.30 and 7.30 in the morning. A junior man, you only get a, a swing or a split shift. And uh, you, may, you might have done two trips to Scott Street, you might have done two to the Union Station. You'd be in about, oh, 9 o'clock, 9.30. Then you come back maybe 1 o'clock in the afternoon till 6 or 6.30. And you've probably done them all at the Union Station. And most of those, you'd run the car in. You wouldn't leave it out. It wouldn't get relieved on the street. You'd run the car in. Now, uh, if you're a motorman or front end, as we used to call it, you had to keep the car on time and avoid accidents as much as possible. And uh, oh, keep your front step clean. And you had a little shovel to do that with. And um, on the back end, the conductor, you had to uh, uh, collect fares check transfers, make sure that uh, no one trying to get away with a late transfer. Uh, keep If the car still had a stove in, you had to keep the fire going and keep the people going to the back of the car as much as possible. And then the trailer, your uh, duties were basically the same. Only you didn't get as many people. You had about one trip, two trips a day you were busy. After that you saw nobody because no one wanted to ride a trailer. It was too cold back there. North of St. Clair, the subway crossed to the west side of Young to bypass the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. At this point, pile drivers were used to prepare the subway for excavation. The noise they made was awful. The Young Line was such a vital transportation link to downtown that it could not be shut down, even for construction. In late 1950, the road was closed for six weeks at this point. Temporary track was laid on the west side of the street. Local traffic was diverted through the side streets. When this work was done, the tracks were relayed in their original location for the Christmas holiday rush. After Christmas, temporary track was laid on the east side of the street, and six weeks later, the tunnel under the street was covered. The road was then open to traffic, the car tracks were then relayed, and service continued as if nothing had happened. Today's Art Deco buildings at Young and Summerhill have only one thing missing to complete the 1950s atmosphere the young trailer trains. Service was a problem at the best of times. Bill Took tells about it at the end. Yeah. Well, the, the reason for the subway, of course, that we all know was traffic congestion on Young Street. And uh, well, I don't recall too much early days. I, I know by the time they started to build the subway, the congestion was getting bad, very bad. And uh, the schedule used to call for 42 trains and 42 minutes and during the normal hours. That was a two-minute service, supposed to be. It didn't work out like that, but it was supposed to be. And rush hour, they give you up to 47, 48 minutes, and of course you had uh, still a minute service on Young Street. You could probably walk the roof of the cars all the way uptown. 
Once the southbound trains pass the future Rosedale station, they cross Bloor Street to Wellesley on their way downtown. In the winter of 1950, an unusual diversion took place north of College Street. Southbound young trains turned east on Maitland to Church Street, and northbound trains turned west on Alexander Street from Church. Temporary track was laid on the top of the street, close to the sidewalk. The tracks were then covered with gravel to allow the residents access to their cars. The speed along this track was limited to five miles per hour. Bill Took tells of the perils of this temporary measure. Uh, well, one, one occurrence uh, happened when the subway diversions, the cars would go east on Maitland, uh, south on Church, and, and west on Alexander, back to Young Street. This is one of the diversions. And this one, one time, was in the winter, and uh, this train was approaching Church Street, and they hit some ice in the grooves of the rail, and they ended up on the other side of Church Street. The motor did, and of course they had the street well blocked. Now, whether it was anything would hit, I don't remember, but I, I know they had Church Street blocked for a few hours. They got it back on again. In September of 1949, when construction began, riders on the Young Line had no idea how many delays and diversions there would be. From 1950 to 1953, there were about 30 that were well publicized in the local press to minimize rider confusion. The downtown part of the line had the most varied of detours because Young Street was being excavated. When construction actually began in 1949, young trains traveled the route on wooden decking as the subway construction took place below. While this decking was being installed, the trailer trains would be diverted to adjacent streets. Toronto didn't have a system of one-way streets at this time, so trailer trains could travel both ways on streets such as Wellington, Richmond, York, and Adelaide. These diversions took their toll on ridership patients, and they also affected the equipment. Bill Took observed the condition of the equipment. From about mid-1953 onward, the TDC started to let the, the uh, condition of the cars go downhill. They only patched patch the, the motors and, and what not up. Before that, uh, they were well known for keeping their equipment in good shape, but I guess they figured it wasn't worth it because they're only going to run another eight months or a year. So uh, I called the mine one day, it would be about February 1954, about two months before the subway opened, and we were coming north, Bill and I, at uh, Pleasant Boulevard, just below St. Clair northbound, and we ran through a puddle and it short-circuited the drawbar. And um, anyhow, we had no power in the trailer after that, so we had to get a change off. So we got pushed in. Well, we took the trailer in. And the mechanic told us that we were the 29th change off that morning. For 23 years, the young cars had looped at the Simcoe Loop. On September 28, 1953, it closed. The young trains now turned from front up York to Wellington and back to Young. While these cars were being ready for the scrap heap, new subway vehicles were being ordered. The TTC had drawn up its own specifications for a small North American PCC-type rapid transit car. But the cost of the bids were so high that the TTC went abroad in search of an alternative. Ray Corley explains why the TTC chose the Glosser, or G-car, over the PCC rapid transit design. In the course of these investigations, the TTC made contact with the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company in England, and they suggested to the TTC that while they could offer a car of the size the TTC suggested, which would involve 130 cars, they proposed a 57-foot car, which would mean only 104 cars were needed to provide the same capacity, at a considerable saving in the price of the overall number of cars and also a, a reduction in the number of equipment items that had to be maintained. The TTC, as a result of this, revised their specifications and asked for bids on both the so-called short 48-49 foot car and the so-called long or 57-foot car. And when these bids were received, the final bids, the Gloucester bid was lower than anything else offered 
particularly lower than the Canadian or the American manufacturers and the PCC rapid transit car design just disappeared in favor of the Gloucester car. Well, the last day of operation for the streetcars was March the 30th, 1954. So Bill and I got into our heads that we'd like to be the last car. So we signed up on the last crew. It was a separate sign up that one day. So we signed up on the last crew. And it was a swing, some kind of a swing we had. And some in the morning come back around 11 o'clock, done the rest. So uh, the inspector downtown, uh, we knew him quite well, and we wanted to remain the last car. And he was turning cars all over the place. So Bill said to him, make sure we're the last car. Well, okay, he says, so he just let us go, and we were the tail end car all day. And uh, so last trip down, let's say we were the last service car the public could ride. I understand he had a private car behind that, but no one, no one could ride that, but the people had, had paid for it. We were the last service car on the line. So uh, it was all exciting, a bit of nostalgia. Um, I was interviewed by Wesley Hicks, the telegram, Bill and I, and uh, account appeared in the paper the next day. And uh, we eventually got to Harvey Yard. Before, we had the last accident with a streetcar in Young. And we were going south on Woodlawn Hill, by the Woodlawn Hill. And... Uh, the rail was black, hard to stop, and this Jaguar came out of Woodlawn to turn north in Young Street, and he stopped right in the rails. And Bill hammered the bell so hard, it came right out of the floor of the car. He pulled the key, done everything to stop, we hit the Jaguar. So anyhow, uh, we asked him why he didn't move, and he said, uh, I thought you were going to stop. So anyhow, we get to Harvey Yard, of course we're late. And the clerk down there, he's got a hat and coat on, all ready to go. And he said, where have you guys been? So we had to tell him. So we went back to Eglinton and made out the last accident report on the, on the streetcar line. And it wasn't even a, a streetcar accident report, it was a bus report. They had all the others destroyed, probably. On Tuesday, March 30th, 1954, the subway opening ceremonies took place at the Davisville subway station. Officials from the provincial and federal governments, civic dignitaries, and TTC management were on hand to mark the occasion. 1954 was also the birth of the Toronto Transit Commission. It was a monopoly formed to absorb all existing local transportation companies within the 13 municipalities that formed Metropolitan Toronto. The new TTC provided a unified transportation system with a common fare structure. Also on display was the Commission's new logo and uniforms. About noon, the dignitaries made their way to the subway station platform where the official switch was thrown. The first day crowds were overwhelming. People lined the bridges to see and later ride the new subway. Ken Allen describes the reaction. Opening day, boy, what a show that was. You couldn't even get on the car to get into your cab for the people with cameras, lunches. All day long, they drove up and down Young Street. Round and round. I guess the TDC didn't mind him doing this. But it was fun. We had people, dignitaries getting on, mostly children with the lunches and adults trying to get pictures all out of that little window at the front. And there wasn't that much room. But you couldn't even get out of the cab when the time come to turn around till all these people had dispersed. In common with all rapid transit systems, the cars were designed for multiple unit control. That is, any number of cars up to the maximum platform length could be coupled together and controlled by a single operator together with, in, this, in the case of the Commission, a guard who operated the doors. The length of the trains was dictated by a 500-foot platform, which meant that the maximum length of train was eight cars. The cars were numbered in the series starting at 5,000 and because they were in multiple unit combinations and the minimum number of cars the TTC would ever have run was two cars, they were coupled together in what we call married pairs. That means that the sum of the equipment was shared between the two cars. The even number cards 
uh, carried the motor generator set which supplied the electrical auxiliary power and the odd number cars carried the compressor. This meant some reduction in the number of equipment items and the weight distribution on the cars.